enchanted words of Dr. Seuss. At the far end of town, where the grickle grass grows, and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows, and no birds ever sing, excepting old crows, is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax? And why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old Wunstler still lives here. Ask him. He knows. You can open your eyes now.
Um, many of you know me from 1992 or the convention preceding 1992 when I was a contender for the vice presidential nomination. And some of you even remember me from 1983 when I was a contender for the presidential nomination. I've been on the platform committee. I've run for office in my state of Michigan, State Board of Education, state rep. I was even endorsed by the Detroit News for State Board of Education as a libertarian. And um, I have written a book, Healing Our World, The Other Piece of the Puzzle, which tries to integrate the libertarian philosophy in its practical aspects with the spiritual aspects of the uh, Christian philosophy and the New Age personal self-responsibility philosophy. So if you think it can't be done, you might want to check out the book. And it's, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, it, it is in Russian now. Um, I have one copy of the Russian edition with me. Um, the Romanian translation's been finished. Uh, Lithuanian one is on its way. There was supposed to be a Yugoslavian translation, but with things the way they are, I haven't heard. Um, and uh, we're getting really good endorsements uh, from Wayne Dyer and Jonathan Wright and Durkin Sandy and uh, Visions Magazine, which calls it the, uh, one of the most important books of the decade. This is a non-libertarian magazine saying this about a book that talks about the libertarian philosophy. So I I'm very excited about it. And as many of you know, I had a great helper in that book, uh, my sister Marty, a California libertarian who, as many of you know, was Dr. Kevorkian's uh, patient. Uh, and died on February 18th. And uh, I'd like to dedicate this talk to her as I have so many of my talks because she left her savings to uh, uh, promote libertarianism in Eastern Europe and that's why we are in Eastern Europe because as you might realize there's not a lot of money to be made selling books there. So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the themes that, uh, that were dear to Marty's and, and my heart. And I want to start with uh, you know, where we are today and, and how we can go further. And uh, now that we've resolved the <coughs> pledge and platform debate, a lot of people are wondering where we're going. And, uh, Um, well, we talked about that, and I don't know, we never actually confirmed, but uh, if he's here, um, Okay. Um, well, what we had talked about is he could follow me. I'd make my comments brief and he could follow me. And, and that's still an option if he's here, but I haven't seen him, so I don't know. Okay, well, you can kind of hang out here and when you see him, if he doesn't want to follow me, he can wave you down, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, where, where are we going from here? Well. I think it was, uh, we had a lot of important things come up in this debate, some things that weren't explicitly talked about. I did the convention circuit this year, so I heard the debate six or seven times. And uh, one thing I found is that what was being said wasn't the real issue. Uh, basically, the CLM issue is that we need to grow, and they're right, we do. And that to grow, we probably need to change, and we probably do. And what I heard from the pledge people were, We've got to be careful. We could get ideological drift. We could become not the party principal anymore, but just another party. And so what I noticed is that there are really several ways to deal with a situation like this. One is to fight about it, have a win-lose situation, where one group wins and the other loses, and one group goes away very ha unhappy. And then the second way, which is another way that we're familiar with, the compromise where we each win a little and we each lose a little. Not totally happy, but at least no one's holding all the losing. Then there's the third way. And I think we saw a little bit of this third way today. And, and I'm so proud because in 83, uh, I saw a lot of libertarians defrauding libertarians. And it really bothered me a lot, which is why I do the Unity Through Community campaigns, which of course is what I'm going to be talking to you about. The third way is the transcendent way, to take the best of what both are saying, the problem that both are bringing attention to, and devise a solution that incorporates the answers to both questions. So both people go away happy, both groups go away happy, the win-win solution. That's what the platform compromise was meant to uh, hopefully uh, take care of. And the transcendent question 
which I think is still very much before us, even though we've resolved pledge and platform issues, is how can we elect more libertarians without undergoing significant ideological shift or drift? How can we do that? And that is the question, because we could elect libertarians tomorrow if we wanted to play the same game the Democrats and Republicans can. As soon as we're willing to promise special interest favors, we will get elected. <laughs> but we wouldn't be libertarian anymore. And yes, we could probably trick the electorate into electing us, uh, maybe if we had lots of money and had name recognition. But you know, I think we'd probably uh, be impeached or recalled because Really, today, most people really don't want what we consider libertarianism. Oh, they want some of it. They don't like to pay taxes, but then they like some of the things that those taxes do, which is force their neighbor to behave the way they want them to. So the only way I know to answer this transcendent question of how we can elect more libertarians without significant ideological drift is to sell more people on the libertarian idea. We have to make more libertarians. Now, if we're trying to sell our ideas, and of course we are, there's a marketplace out there, why do people buy? Well, as any good salesperson knows, there's only really one reason why people buy. Because they think it's in their best self-interest to do so. It's the only reason. It's one we can understand as libertarians. Yet. We don't normally address it that way, and I'd like to today. I'd like to make the case that libertarianism is a win-win solution, that nobody loses, even the special interests that seem to gain by today's system. And I figure if I can make the case for special interests, it'll be easy to make it for everyone else. So I'll take the hard one first. And there's a reason to do this, because if libertarianism, libertarianism is a win-win solution, then everybody out there Everybody is our customer, and it's only a matter of pointing out the obvious to them. So let's take the special interest case. And to do that, I need to talk a little bit about the nature of wealth. Now, if you think about wealth for a minute, you recognize that if you're on a desert island with no food, clothing, water, shelter, etc., but you have a billion dollars worth of gold coin, you're still not very wealthy compared to how you are here in this room. That's because wealth, of course, is goods and services, not money. If you can't buy anything on the desert island, well, you're not very wealthy. So sitting here in the room today, you're quite wealthy compared to the desert island. You're wealthy because goods and services are created by you and your fellow human beings. They're created. There's more wealth in the world today than there was 2,000 years ago. Even if you were the wealthiest person on Earth 2,000 years ago, you didn't have penicillin when your child got appendicitis. Even if you were the ruler of a nation, you couldn't just pick up the phone and call your sister or brother who had moved halfway across the world to marry another into another kingdom. You couldn't fly to them. Now, we have a lot of wealth that, that, uh, that's special for today because we've created it. And of course, we as libertarians know the free market is the big, biggest creator of wealth. So when we have the free market, when we have the libertarian ideal, we have a greater, larger wealth pie. And obviously, everybody benefits. Because you can't buy what hasn't been created. So even the wealthy of yesteryear, or even the wealthy of a not-so-libertarian society, are not as wealthy as they would be in a libertarian society. There's just more wealth in a libertarian society. So one reason that even the special interests lose is by keeping the wealth pie small. They limit their own access to things like cures for cancer, cures for AIDS, ways to make us live longer. And of course, you'll hear Dirk and Sandy talk about that a little bit and find out exactly what the mechanism is by which this wealth creation is attenuated. But there's another aspect. A lot of you are aware that there's information coming forward in the medical field, which I'm a part of. I'm a research scientist by profession that indicates that how we think influences how we feel, our health. And you know, it's really interesting because here, being a libertarian is a good idea too. You know about the type A personality, the aggressive personality. Well, when, when you analyze exactly what the type A personality is, it's a person that believes someone else is to blame for their problems. Doesn't that sound familiar? Just like the government officials are always saying, we have poverty because of the rich. That's a type A belief. 
And the cancer-prone personality or type C personality is the one that feels helpless to do anything about it. I'm poor and it's not my fault, so you have to help me. It's up to you. We've heard that one before too. Maybe it's no uh, coincidence that our major diseases are heart disease and cancer in this country. But there's another way to go, and that is to have what I call the self-actualized personality. That's a person who does not blame other people for their lack of happiness and feels competent to achieve, achieve that happiness. In other words, they take the responsibility for their happiness and they feel free to choose. They're the libertarian personality, or what I call the type S self-actualized personality, and they live longer than either of the other two groups. So, if you want to live a long time, thinking like a libertarian is also in your best self-interest, and that's something money can't buy. So another reason that special interests lose when they advocate a system that is non-libertarian is they lose their life, essentially. They lose part of their life because they're blaming other people and feeling they need to dominate other people in order to get their happiness or their piece of the pie. And the reasons they're using for this is that other people can't help themselves, so they, of course, must take on um, the world or the American people or whoever it is in order to grasp the fruits of their labor to help these poor, helpless people. And so we see that from a health standpoint, the libertarian idea is a good idea. So from the wealth point and the health point. But there's one other point that's very, very important. I had the opportunity once to talk to a gentleman who was very much involved in serving the special interests at a very high level. His picture was on the cover of Time magazine, for example. Um, and I asked him, what were his goals in life? And he said, power and money. Quite blunt. But you know, I already knew that about him and realized that I hadn't been clear. I really didn't want to know what his goals were. I wanted to know what would make him happy because I could see he wasn't a very happy person. It doesn't really take a whole lot of savvy to see that someone isn't happy. And so I asked him that question and I was very surprised that he was so open with me. He said, he said, you know, I feel disconnected from the rest of the human race. I feel that I'm not a part. And if I could change anything about my life, it would be that. And at the time, this was many years ago, I really didn't appreciate the importance of what was being said here. This person used aggression regularly. And the result was that he had to say, me and you, us and them. He had to cause separation between himself and others. And therefore, of course, he felt disconnected. How else could he feel? And so, once again, we see the libertarian ideal is very important to our personal happiness because it is my belief that it's very difficult to be happy when you feel separated from the rest of humankind and that that connectedness is part of what gives us our joy. So there are three reasons, three, not one, three, that I can find and maybe you know more uh, why the libertarian ideal is a win-win situation even for those who seem to benefit by today's system. Now think on the implications of that. If nobody loses in a libertarian world, everybody out there, everybody out there finds it in their best interest, or will find it if we can explain it properly, to be libertarian. There are no enemies out there. They're all going to be libertarian at some point. They'll all move towards that if they want their own happiness if they look to their own best self-interest. In fact, if you think about it, we have an advertiser's dream. If you ever look in the manuals on how to sell something, it says the kind of words you should mention are wealth, health, happiness, love. I mean, we just talked about all those things, if you assume that connectedness is a type of love. We have the absolute most wonderful selling package that anyone could have. So how come we aren't selling it? Well, I believe that it's partly because we are not practicing our philosophy fully. I mean, look at the implications of this. If somebody came up to you to sell you something and said, you should buy this because I want my commission, you would not be, you would not be very convinced that it's in your best self-interest. 
And yet, essentially, when you think about it, that's what we do when we say to somebody, you should become a libertarian because it's right and because I want my freedom. It just isn't a good sell point. What the best salespeople do is they try to stand in the other person's shoes. They try to be them and ask themselves, now, what does this person want? How is my product in their best self-interest? And the best salesmen put the customer first. Isn't that right? Isn't that the free market way? Putting the customer first, serving the customer best. What will help this person? And yet, we really don't do that as often as we could because we have not learned part of our philosophy, which is that if we can simply put ourselves in the other person's shoes, put them first for a moment, be unselfish, and just try to show them what is in their best interest, we'll have that reflected back to us. It's in our best self-interest to put our customer first. Every businessman knows that. It's the free market way. You serve your customer, and then your customer serves you. That's what buying and selling is all about. And I'd like to suggest to you that the free market says that the way to be selfish, to be selfish in an enlightened way, is to some extent to be unselfish and put the other first. Now, I know we've resisted this a lot in the party because we've talked a lot about the virtue of selfishness. And there is virtue in selfishness, but we want to make sure we're real selfish, very selfish, and that we get what we want. So we've, to do that, we have to give the other person what they want first. And so when we approach people, we need to, we need to help them find their best self-interest in the libertarian ideal. And then we won't have to worry. We won't have to convince for our own sake. If we show them it's in their best self-interest, they'll certainly buy. And, you know, people, to do that, we really need to do it in a very um, authentic way. In other words, a person can tell if you're approaching them and sort of trying to sell them and only putting their self-interest there because you're trying to sell them. So you have to really, if you want to be the very best salespeople, and the very best salespeople do this, really put your customer first. And I'd like to tell a little story about this, about a group of people, just like us in many ways, that were trying to grow and were having problems. To give you an example of how this works, I've taken this, uh, I've taken the liberty of borrowing it from M. Scott Peck's book. Uh, and in that, he talks about a monastery that was having trouble recruiting new members. And so in desperation, the head of the monastery, an abbot, now this shows you how desperate he was, went to visit the wise old rabbi in the woods. I mean, you gotta be pretty desperate, right, to go across the lines. Just like we're kind of going to the Democrats and Republicans saying, what are they doing that we're not doing? And he went to visit this rabbi and, and said, what can I do to increase my membership? And the rabbi says, I really can't tell you much about that, but I do have something very important to tell you. He said, one of the members of your monastery is the next Messiah. And so when the abbot came back, as you might imagine, there was pandemonium in the monastery. Everybody wanted to know who it was. But the abbot didn't have that information because the rabbi couldn't tell him. And so they figured, well, we'll just keep on waiting, and in God's good time, we'll find out. But you know, it wasn't the same anymore because the monks that had been bickering among themselves were a little nervous about bickering with each other now. After all, you didn't want to be saying nasty things about the next messiah. <laughs> Very dangerous. And you also, of course, had to consider that you might be the next messiah. Uh, which meant, of course, that you really should be taking care of yourself a little bit and maybe acting in a way that you wouldn't be ashamed of later if you found out you were the next messiah. <laughs> And so the atmosphere at the monastery slowly changed. Everybody started teach, uh, uh, treating each other with extraordinary respect, just on the off chance, of course, they were dealing with the next messiah. And eventually, as they got more and more into this pattern of extraordinary respect for each other, taking care of each other, watching over each other, and of course, gently correcting and discussing with each other, 
um, a whole new atmosphere pervaded the monastery, and the villagers that picnicked in the forest began to look at the monastery and look at how the monks interacted with each other and said, what do they know that we don't? What secret do they have that we don't? The people that we want to follow are the ones that can take us to peace and plenty and happiness. And even when the monks don't have much, they all, they all have it because they take care of each other, they share. They're pleasant to each other and they're so happy. What do they know that we don't? And so they started going and questioning the monks. And eventually, some of the young people decided that, well, even though they didn't totally understand, they wanted to be a part of this. And they would come and stay at the monastery, and eventually, some of them joined. And the monastery grew and flourished, and they never did find out who was the next messiah. <laughs> I really enjoy this story because I feel that this is the part of our philosophy that we have missed. It is okay to be unselfish. It is okay to take care of others. Those are our customers. They're our friends. And I'm really proud that today, when we had the Pledge and Platform debate, that we didn't hear a lot of name calling because there was a time when there was a lot of bickering. I know there was a little bit, but was much, much better, and I was really proud to be a part of the party today, proud of that atmosphere. But we can even move further, because we need to extend that extraordinary respect that we're learning to show each other to the people that we talk to that don't share our views as well, remembering always that it's in their best self-interest, and that if we are working on their best self-interest and showing them the libertarian philosophy that comes from our heart, that they will respond. Andre Maru is very fond of telling a story about a socialist that was elected in New Hampshire. And he wanted to find out how this person got elected because he got elected from a very conservative area. And so he questioned the voters. And you know what they said? They said, yeah, we don't believe any of this guy's ideas, but he sure is a nice guy. <laughs> People instinctively know that a person who is loving, a person that tries to understand the other, a person that will put themselves in the other's shoes, a person that will even go the full way to put the other first, is ultimately the person they can trust the most, the person who is most likely not to attack them, after all, if you've got that kind of philosophy. And you know, when we interact with each other and those other people, we have to remember that the person we're talking to even by doing so simple, something so simple as dropping their literature about the Libertarian Party that someone else picks up and talks to someone else and recruits maybe the next presidential candidate or the next person that's going to be elected as a Libertarian to the state legislature or maybe even the first person that's going to be elected president. We have to remember that every one of us is a link in that chain and therefore deserving of our extraordinary respect. We have to embody what these monks found, but never really truly acknowledged, and that is that each of us is the next Messiah. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions at this point. Yes. Uh, what about nihilism? Uh, about what? Nihilism. Nihilism? It, I thought about this, and I sometimes think that people oppose freedom and the free market. The only conceivable reason is they actually have malice in their heart, and they, they are nihilists. Okay. Because sometimes the logic Not with some arcane issues, but there are some issues that are so obvious. The minimum wage may not be the best example. You really have to be malicious to support that type of policy. Okay, let me repeat your let me let me repeat that so that we can get it on tape and then I'll comment. The uh, the gentleman was saying that some people that don't support the libertarian ideal or parts of it must be malicious because there's you know and, and the evidence is so clear. 
Um, I think that, let me say first, I think there is a lot of misunderstanding, but there are people who are malicious, and think about those people. Are they acting in their own best interests? Are those happy people? I don't know any malicious people that are happy. <laughs> the happiest people I know are pretty, uh, pretty loving and friendly people. No, and, and they're unhappy. They're unhappy. And that's where you can appeal malicious. to them. That's why they're malicious. Yes, they're unhappy, they're malicious, and they think that's going to help them. So your job is sometimes one of psychology, which of course is to uh, try to relate to that unhappiness and show them where it's coming from. Show them that that's not helping them to strike out. And in some, in some cases, what that means, of course, is that we're talking about more than the libertarian philosophy. We're talking about inner growth. And that's something we need to integrate in order for us to be able to share it. Yes? Mary, I've given away probably 15 copies of your book to people who want to know about libertarianism. And almost verbatim from everyone who has come back, they have <laughs> so, people are not stupid, and, and not all of them are malicious. They just don't. But Mary's book is a great tool. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Is Bumper here? No, okay. I don't know what happened with that, but. He's probably lost. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, um, what last call for questions? And uh, if not, no questions, then I will uh, close the session. I'll stay here for a few minutes to talk with those who might want to uh, continue. I want to thank you. I hope that you'll consider moving forward in this other direction because I really think that that's what we need to do. Other people can teach us that. If we're going to teach them, we can learn from them, too. And I think they're teaching us an important lesson. We need to come from the heart as well as the head. Thank you.